Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Singita Bundu, and I am your moderator for day two of Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies webinars in commemoration of Labor Day 2022. Just a reminder that today is the second of three panels. And for those of us who would have had the opportunity to tune in live yesterday, the first panel has a very high standard for discussions and we are gonna do our best this afternoon to meet their standard, the standard set by them. So just a thank you to the members on the first panel. For those of us who are not familiar with me, my name is Sangeeta Bundu. I am an adjunct lecturer at Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. Prior to that, I had the privilege of working with the government of Trinidad and Tobago as an attorney at law for over 13 years, most of that time at the Ministry of Labor. And at that, in that capacity, I had a lot of opportunities to represent the government and the country and work on labor issues. So it's my pleasure this afternoon to be moderating this panel with Fallon Singh and Shanice Webb as our panelists. Unfortunately, our third panelist, Dr. William Perry, is unable to join us because he is unwell. So this afternoon, the ladies are holding down the fort. So before I introduce our first speaker, Fallon Lutchman Singh, I just want to remind viewers that you can feel free to introduce yourself on the chat and pay attention to the links that will come up in terms of the feedback questionnaire and ask your questions via the chat box and we will put them to the panelists after their presentations and have a lively discussion. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker this afternoon. Our first speaker is Fallon Lutchman Singh. Fallon is a scientist, researcher, and technical coordinator. Her clinical and public health research and publications over the last 15 years include biochemistry, metabolic pathways, health policy, early intervention, and screening for lifestyle diseases like diabetes, childhood obesity, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. She is currently the health research scientist consultant for the Diabetes and Pregnancy Screening Program in Trinidad and Tobago, a national program of the Directorate of Women's Health, Ministry of Health, Government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. So with that introduction, I invite Fallon to make her presentation as we discuss this afternoon's topic, never letting a good crisis go to waste. Alan, I hand it over. Thank you, um, Sangeeta, and thank you to Labour College for having us this evening. Uh, pleasant evening to everyone looking on, pleasant evening to Shanice, um, uh, and happy to be part of this panel of, of ladies moderated by yourself, Sangeeta. Give me one second as I get the presentation into slideshare mode. There we go. So um, task this evening to go first uh, around a healthcare approach. And I think I share the same feeling of everyone when we're very tired of hearing of the C word <laughs> and the P word <laughs> of COVID and the pandemic and how it has completely changed our lives. Um, much of the disaster around COVID and the pandemic isn't necessarily new. It really just unearthed so many things we already knew we really needed to take a closer look at. So for this evening, I just wanted to focus on the opportunity aspects of this crisis, looking at people-centered approach to healthcare. Um, while my area is on non-communicable diseases, I'll tell you why I'm not overtly going to speak about COVID directly. It's because we've spoken about it. It's been in our lives. <laughs> when we use the word, it's like a trigger, right? So let's look at the way forward a bit. So a people-centered approach to healthcare is exactly as, as the phrase uh, implies. It's you at the center. You at the center of this community of 
care approach and social approach to your care, where it isn't a disease management type approach, where traditionally, and where we live in Trinidad and Tobago and in the Western world, the healthcare models are largely um, disease management oriented. There are benefits to that system, but as we have seen over the years, um, it can then bottleneck to a lot of the tertiary level institutions such as hospitals and leave a lot of us um, failing in the wind when we don't have a crisis level type tertiary care situation where we have to present at the hospital. So we knew the situation, we were overwhelmed. The system, the staff, the facilities. There was a restricted capacity to provide services, standard services, not ne necessarily only for people who were COVID positive, but just standard services across the board. Patient backlogs were not unique to this pandemic. They existed long before. In a country like Trinidad and Tobago, where one in two people over the age of 65 have an NCD, a non-communicable disease, diabetes, hypertension, a cardiovascular issue. I mean, if just on this panel, since I can't see the audience, but I'll ask you if you're watching at home or at work or wherever you are, raise your hand if you know someone with an NCD, with hypertension or diabetes. Keep your hand raised if that person is in your immediate family. Keep your hand raised if they have had to go to the public health system at least once. Keep your hand raised if they have stayed there for more than three to four hours to even be seen by a healthcare provider prior to the pandemic. So a lot of these things are not new. You can put your hands down, down to actually be participating. Uh, it's difficult to access standard care. You know, this can be as simple as screening, a screening test. This could be as simple as being pregnant and having to do routine care. Um, so it's across the board, the human resource, the logistics and the supply chain shortages. We've heard the stories, we've read the articles, we've seen the storm. Physical and mental burnout of health, the healthcare work, workforce. You know, we're commemorating Labor Day and, and cannot be um, glossed over that they aren't just heroes, but heroes imply the word hero implies that they're supposed to have this super strength continuously and unlimited, but they are people too. And one of the things about the healthcare workforce is that they are the providers and the recipients of care. And we say that, and we know it's almost obvious, but it, it, it needs to be said that the physical and mental burnout of the healthcare workforce was also something that was underlying prior to the pandemic. The worn out hospital infrastructure specifically at the hospital level, again, because our model, our current care system bottlenecks at the tertiary level of hospitals. So the communication around care is you only show up and it's really dire and it's an emergency and you show up at the hospital. Fair, vulnerability and uncertainty, aspects that cannot be go going on, you know, without being mentioned. So what are the opportunities that lie ahead when we look at some of these issues that we're um, juggling now two years in and some people say almost out of the pandemic. Um, I want to focus really on aspects of patient-centered care but really the opportunities around service design and delivery, um, delivery that is timely, relevant and appropriate. In an age of information and digitization, um, at a national level, we have a new ministry, um, but for 10 years or so on a social level, we have spent a lot of time with a lot of information in the palm of our hands. Most people have a cell phone across Trinidad and Tobago. Some people have two. When it comes to a smartphone device, there's more than 90% of people in Trinidad and Tobago. Whether or not it has access to data um, may be variable, but more than a hundred and something percent of people have a device. So there's more than one going around. So text messaging might be also a basic way to provide timely health information. So we need to understand the lay of the land with the service delivery that we're trying to provide and this reliance on paper records and, and the person coming into the healthcare as opposed to the healthcare going out to the person where they are um, isn't only you know, just around telemedicine, but it's around the design of record keeping, uh, design of 
how you share patient and person health information because the patient's health information should be in the ownership of the patient. So that you know transcends into the laws around um, health information and how health information is shared. Um, I'll slightly deviate into story to say I dare you to go and ask for a medical record had you been in the hospital in the last year or prior to the pandemic and see how long it would take you to even acquire a copy of that. It's definitely not timely um, and it is not necessarily the most easy thing to retrieve. Driving efficiency with technology. That is the buzz now. Telemedicine is the buzz digitization is the buzz, but how can we do it right now without all of the infrastructure being totally connected and in, 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 in a large, let's say, centralized electronic healthcare system of recording? Easy solutions are small cloud-based health records that start at the level of a regional health authority or a health center so that everything can be retrieved easily. The patient doesn't have to wait for hours to have their files retrieved, paper loss. Point of care diagnostics is another um, one, might be getting a bit specific here, but really it's where you are, I test you, as opposed to you come into the hospital, you wait for an appointment, you go back to the actual appointment, and then you come back for the day of the test, and then you go back home, and then you come back. We have to understand that people don't necessarily live in a space that is close to these centers, nor is it always cost effective nor is the transportation readily available or safe for them to spend this amount of time getting to and from. So point of care can bring that care to um, persons in their community. Collaborative teams is a big part of patient-centered care. And it goes beyond the healthcare provider, the doctor, the nurse, as immediately in front of the person to the administrators, the patients themselves and the policy makers so it really does require an overall collaboration. This is not an exhaustive list. It's just to show that it's not a linear list of doctor to patient only. When you get deeper into the model of like patient care, patient, sorry, person-centered care. So patient, let me just stop to say that patient-centered care uh, was the, one of the first phrases that they used to try and put people at the center, but then they realized even that terminology and that's why I'm slipping in and out of it. Um, patient-centered, again, puts the focus on the patient having a disease or a disease and the linear relationship. People-centered brings the community of care uh, into the mix, right? So I'll just go across these that I touched on in the previous slide, is fast access to reliable health advice, fast access. We have so many things at our fingertips. Why don't we have reliable health advice? Effective treatment delivered by trusted professionals, a continuity of care and smooth transitions. What does that mean? It means that when you show up at the primary health care center, which is closer to you because there are many more of them, there are 109 across Trinidad and Tobago, in your community, which is closer to you, you can have that record keeping if you were to go from Matlot to Scarborough and then come back to San Fernando General Hospital or say you had an incident and had to show up somewhere else in Diego Martin, if you moved around within a specific period of time, anytime, that continuity of care goes with you because there's an interconnected system and there's a longer care model for you versus a single visit to a single center. Involvement in decisions, sorry, the involvement in the decisions in respect and respect the preferences of the patient. It's a big one. <laughs> um, it's a cultural one. I'd let Shanice go much more into that um, in terms of except I'm batting where I know I can play, right? <laughs> but I would say that we tend to have an approach generally in the population of the doctors and the healthcare providers telling us um, the advice and we never question it or we are fearful to question it in the face of the healthcare provider. And so opening the dialogue um, becomes very important here on both the part of the person receiving the care and the person delivering the care. And this is where continuous medical training needs to in involve communication skills and customer service delivery and not just um, clinical and technological advances. 
clear, comprehensive, com comprehensible information and support for self-care. This is where the technology comes in again, but also empowering the person to motivate themselves to then continuously seek care, as opposed to this bottlenecking into the hospital, only waiting when it's a crisis or an emergency, um, taking that responsibility in their own hand uh, through apps, through a self-testing device, but also through culturally relevant and clear communication that is provided that and reduces vulnerability and fear at the point of the visit and the continuity of care, the way the care is received. So they all tend to feed into each other. Granted, they are here as eight separate elements of this model. The involvement of support and family for careers. Um, we almost always have to leave our family outside. I will again venture into a short story to say my mother was hospitalized for COVID in, in last year, in 2021. And she was allowed no visitors and I could not speak to her because her oxygen level was so low that she was a bit disoriented. Um, it was only because a nurse uh, I knew was working one day in her facility that she made a call on her cell phone. And it made such a difference in my mother's outlook of even being able to come out of the hospital alive. And that is a conversation that um, pivoted for us her, her, the way her care was delivered and received. Um, she had always been a very independent person. So to have no one, not, not be sure of knowing where she was and what was going on, but also to see no one in a time where we have you know, data and mobile phones um, and the ability to have enough staff be a bit aware of that. Now, that is not their priority. When a, let's look at the other side of the coin. When a step-down facility or healthcare facility has 42 patients for two nurses, those nurses need to focus on keeping people alive and taking care of their basic needs. So it, it is in that particular situation difficult to then ask them to do something social or human. But what type of care are we delivering if we are asking two nurses to care for 42 patients in a step-down facility during a crisis for 12-hour shift? So this is, again, the interconnection of the human resource to the type of care that we develop. So we can't just train the nurses and expect them to do miracles um, when they're understaffed and under-resourced. So the quality of care comes back to the resources, comes back to the involvement, but it also comes back to how we design the system itself. Emotional support, empathy and respect in all spheres and attention to the physical and environmental needs, which is, which is usually present. So we sort of went through this. Um, I would just say that, I think on the third point here, that to be, People focused or person focused, it, it really has to be accessible, comprehensive, and continuous over time and coordinated with the patients themselves or persons themselves, especially when they have to receive care elsewhere because you're not a static being. You don't just come into one center for healthcare. I'll go forward in the interest of time. So, this is the model. And let's ask ourselves. We've all interacted or had someone we love interact with the healthcare system. Can we honestly say, um, other than measurement, that we have received comprehensive care delivery? Purpose, strategy, and leadership is, is very clear to us in the way we receive and deliver care. Capability and the culture uh, sometimes is not on the side of working for the model of healthcare that is delivered. Um, what are the governance structures that are we working with? Is it this disease management approach? Is it, this, is it a crisis within a crisis approach that we have set up and therefore without disaster plans and disaster recovery plans for well, not just something like COVID, but um, we are a small island developing state for a climate or, or a natural disaster. What happens when we have an influx of people needing to get healthcare from other things that are going to happen in this region? 
Uh, what is the governance around that? What is the priority around that? Um, partnerships and the technology and the built environment. So move forward with a couple of quotes, just so that I don't bore you all with the model of healthcare <laughs> to say that it seems huge, right? It seems like this big system that we need to fix all at once. But really what has been proven by the science is if you simplify the difficult and what has been proven by COVID, something as simple as wearing PPE, just putting it into context, simplifying the difficult can be protective and be a big win and build on them instead of trying to start this overhaul of the crisis situation. Um, and rather than delivering nothing at all. So a lot of times we hear a lot of promises around these you know, large targets and large projects, but are we reaching the people that we need to reach by these larger projects with, when we miss the small wins? Simply automating existing manual processes will not improve efficiency. Um, and when we look at digitization as a, as a tool in a people-centered model or intuitive model to the current system that we have, it's a process of adaptive change. So it's not gonna be this big overhaul um, something as simple as having a unique um, identifier has been a 30 year conversation for health. Um, Facebook figured it out, <laughs> you know, Instagram has figured it out. Um, the people who built these apps didn't necessarily finish high school or college, you know what I mean? Some of them just built it, the guy that, that built WhatsApp, he just, he went into Facebook one day they didn't interview him for a job. He decided to build this thing that can just send free text messages. And then years later, Facebook bought it from him for $16 million. A simple thing he wanted to do. He just took a chance and he changed it, changed the scape of the environment. He built WhatsApp and sold it back to Facebook. Just simplify the difficult. What you measure will improve. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. Um, as a scientist, I have to say that I am an advocate for measuring um, and ensuring that you get real-time results and verification. I mean, nothing works like that in terms of reporting and then dealing with it so it's right in front of you before it becomes bigger and bigger. It happens too often that new technology is often frustrating. This is a downside of digitization as a solution. Just wanted to put it there. Um, therefore, a lot of potentially good data is not being used. So you bring in this nice glossy solution, you talk about digitization, and then often what happens is you don't take the time to build the systems around it, train the people around you because your community is of most utter importance in any technology-driven solution to then have this patient-centered approach. Um, and so user-friendly IT solutions have been proven to frustrate clinicians and nurses, tend to kill the adoption of some of these things. This is in the local landscape and across, you know, internationally and regionally, you find that this is across the board data that proves that if you just put in an IT solution without considering first the environment and the cultural needs, um, it can lead to even further burnout for staff um, and create a, even a, more of a barrier between the provider and the person receiving care. So we need systems that make work easy. So generally redesigning, my points are redesigning patients and healthcare provider experiences at the center with people at the center, streamlining the healthcare delivery and maximizing technology, but also being aware that maximizing the technology can be and needs to be more specific to the environment in which the technology is coming in, as opposed to this technology that works over here, but then needs to be fitted into your environment. So if I was to use this as an example, patient-centered care going forward, and I was to use the tool of digitization, telehealth, or just an uptake of a digital solution in a people-centered care model, I would say stepwise, you start with the system design. This is more of an engineering way of thinking, but a system design way of thinking which is why we need multi-sectoral teams. People at the center, literally and figuratively, and then digital enablement last, as opposed to 
finding the solution, trying to fit it into the existing system and hoping that the people can benefit. So system design here, the digital so solution, as in this example, the design should support clinical workflow for users rather than hinder it. It shouldn't make their life more frustrating. It shouldn't take longer to fill out this digital form. It should be shorter. It should have a faster to do. It should be more efficient. People-centered care, regular access to person's health information. They empower with so much more other pieces of information. If you give them access, they, it will empower them. Just think about wanting to know the, the results of your lab test and waiting for days. Sometimes you know that you're healthy, but you're still waiting for the results of this test. There is no, there's all of the infrastructure in place. Most people have a cell phone and most places you can have access to data. Not most, but some. Let me, let me retract that. You can at base have access to SMS text messages. So that's another thing. Um, when we look at this big digitization program, are we saying that if we don't have access to data for everybody, we can't provide improved services? So people-centered. What is the lay of the land? What, are, what is the infrastructure? And what do we need to do? We need to get them information. There are ways to do it now with the technology and the infrastructure and the devices that people have now. There are ways to digitize now. Digital enablement in the workplace and the greater use of digital, we already know will reshape the way we train and build capacity for the staff in a way that doesn't frustrate them. And lastly, Technology can never really replace great teachers. I love this quote. But in the hands of great teachers, it's transformational. So I took you down the path of my patient-centered ideas of modeling and using digitization as a, a possible way forward. Um, thank you. And um, went to questions at the end. Thank you very much Fallon for that very interesting presentation I feel I have a set of questions for you based on what you've shared with us um, thank you too for putting it into context for us when we were planning as labor practitioners and we were contemplating the fourth industrial revolution what this new century would bring for us one of the things we did not pay a lot of focus on was healthcare and the health and well-being as a potential area for crisis. There was a lot of conversation about digitization, a lot of conversation about environmental impacts, especially as small island developing states. But somehow we kind of lost healthcare in the middle there. And thank you for pointing out to us also that, yes, we are in the midst of a crisis, hopefully fingers crossed towards the end, but we are in the midst of one and it presents us with an opportunity to learn from it and you've also shown us some things that we can look at and utilize to implement. So I'm sure the audience have a few questions for you already lined up. But at this time, we're going to turn to Shanice. I'm also excited to introduce Shanice and listen in on Shanice's presentation. Shanice Webb is the former president of the Trinidad Youth Council. She has over eight years of experience in youth leadership and youth development and has served as a youth leader, both locally and regionally. She has served as a youth leader to the United Nations Population Fund and held the position of vice chairperson of the Caribbean Regional Youth Council with responsibility for resources mobilization for the period 2013 to 2015. And equally important is the fact that Shanice is passionate about the advancement of the youth passion is what we need a lot of. So I hand it over to you, Shanice. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Um, for give, and thank you again to the Elma Francois Institute for allowing us the opportunity to um, share today as we celebrate Labor Day and the Labor Movement as well. Fallon, your presentation is really excellent. I'm um, really looking forward to you diving deeper with the question and answer segment. So I will share my screen and uh, begin my presentation. So, right. 
So my topic for today is community mobilization, mobilizing community resources as a component of an alternative model for sustainable economic and social development. When I was given this topic, um, you know, there's so many angles, so many ways that you can really take this topic. Um, you know, I think that was probably the hardest part, really figuring out like which aspect of community am I really going to try to speak to, right? And as you see the definition I have up here, there's so many definitions when you speak about community, right? Community could be, you know, people with similar characteristics living in a similar place, like your, your village or your family that could be part of your community. It could be people scattered across society. For example, the medical community as Fana was talking about, or um, people who work for a specific company, um, even looking at a body of persons or nations that have a common history, common social, economic, and political interests. When you look at CARICOM, the Caribbean community, um, you're looking internationally, you're looking at the European Union, they're also considered to be a community, right? People linked by common policies, they're looking at, you know, even like treaties and different things like that. So there's so many aspects when we talk about community, right? Um, but I really wanted to focus on young people because my history in terms of youth development, I'm, I'm really excited and passionate about seeing young people um, not just in Trinidad, but in the region, just, you know, really advance and take advantage of the opportunities in front of them, but as well as making sure that we create spaces and these opportunities as well, right? So also looking at community mobilization. So when I talk about community mobilization, it's really a process of bringing together as many stakeholders as possible to raise persons' awareness on the demand for a particular program or to assist in delivering resources and services and to strengthen community participation for stability and self-reliance. A lot can be achieved when people from different parts of the community share common goals to achieve and participate in, in both identifying needs and, and being a part of the solution. So really and truly, it's really about us coming together, uh, working towards different solutions and no other event shows community mobilization as the Labor Day celebration. If you've never been, it is a sight to see and something really extraordinary to be a part of as a part of the Trinidad Youth Council that's been for several years. Um, if you can make out the picture, it's a, it's, um, a crew of people from Cipriani at Labor Day, right? And I hope persons viewing will be going as well to participate this year. Um, but yes, that's part of what community mobilization is about. It's about getting people on board to really um, speak to different issues. Um, and it could take place on multiple fronts and multiple levels, whether it's um, within your, where you live, where you work, your country, and the international community as well, right? But when you look at young people and it comes to the pandemic, young people severely affected, right? Uh, there's a quote by the Director General of the World Health Organization where they said young people are less likely to be less, less at risk for severe disease and death from COVID-19, but the most affected by long-term consequences of the pandemic, which shaped the world and they live and the work in decades to come, right? Young people, as we can see in Trinidad and Tobago, very evident um, as well when we saw the, the scores of people trying to um, access the opportunity to work on a crucial. We can see that employment is a huge issue in Trinidad and Tobago, right? We can see that there's a great need. We can see that the effects of the pandemic was wide reaching. And um, when we look at our food shelves, when we go to the supermarket, when we go at the pump, we see the effects of the, the, the pandemic. And we can also see that it's not just a Trinidad issue, but we can see it's a global issue. We can see that if we are all connected in that way, so that the issues affecting us in our local country is also part of a wider web of international um, challenges 
and international global effects, right? Um, when I was in secondary school, we learned about globalization, right? That was a, something we discussed in POB, and it really is something that we've seen firsthand with this pandemic, not just with the spread of it, but also in terms of the way in which countries chose to deal with it, as well as the different mandate. So we really see that it's not just about um, where we are in terms of location, but we are all connected, whether through the internet, through whatever means, we all have a shared experience, no matter where we are, right? So getting back to young people, young people experience high levels of job and income loss because Really and truly, young people tend to hold low income jobs, right? There was a temporary employment in sectors most affected by the crises. We're looking at gig economies and restaurant economies, and we're thankful that these things are now coming back. And we're seeing people go back out and facilitate these, um, these businesses, right? But in face of the loss and drop in income, income, young people are more likely to fall to poverty as well as there are a few fewer savings to fall back on, so they are less likely to be able to bounce back from these economic challenges, right? Additionally, illustrated by previous economic shocks, young people graduating in times of crisis find it more difficult to find decent work and income, which are likely to delay their path to financial independence. Despite the flexibility and commitment shown by schools and teachers to in securing educational continuity during school closures, not only students had been able to consistently access education, not all students were able to consistently access education. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development estimates that the loss in school years can be considered equivalent to the loss of seven to 10% of lifetime income, right? So the context of school closures and the quality of home learning environments become even more important. The digital divide and the connectivity across digital divide in connectivity and access to electronic devices further amplify inequalities among young people during the pandemic. And for instance, students from less well-off families are less likely to access digital learning resources and parental support for home learning. The closure of schools affect the mental health and well-being of teachers as well as students, right? Because, you know, these are persons that are part of their social support, you know, being able to provide them with social and emotional support while in school, so that really affects young people. Educational professionals also play an important role in helping detect and report abuse against children. In addition, the postponement and cancellation of exams also expose youth and children to uncertainty, anxiety, and stress, right? And this is according to the UN. School dropout rates in the Caribbean are up 20% higher than the average in Latin America and the Caribbean, according to the Inter-American Development Bank, and that was in 2015. You could only imagine uh, what these numbers are currently. So, when we look at the challenges faced by young people, one of the mechanisms um, we looked at in terms of how to combat these challenges was really looking at youth mainstreaming, right? This is in order to help us really put young people in focus, right? And really see them as a resource for our country and for our community and seeing how best we can really tap into them by also empowering them at the same time. Because a lot of time we see when we deal with young people and as a young person we experience what is considered tokenism, you know, you're given certain opportunities because they wanna see a young face or whatever, they just have one person in the room but they don't really have any real power or any real say so, right? But we really want to look at how we really embrace young people in the ways that we create programs and policies, right? So youth mainstreaming can be defined as a strategies for intergenerational equity, justice, and enabling young people's capacity, 
participation and human rights to be an integral part and dimension of integral dimension of the analysis, design, and implementation of, and monitoring evaluation of policies, programs, in intersectional planning across all social, political, and economic spheres. So we're not just talking about the government, but we're also looking at civil society, we're also looking at employers, we're looking at schools, um, religious organizations, right? Sometimes when they go to church, you don't necessarily see young people that look like you, or when they go to whatever um, faith-based organization that you attend, you may not always see young people in the leadership, right? They may be in the Sunday school, but they may not be a part of the, the decision-making process or whatever. Right? So sometimes we need to see young people mainstream, not just because a lot of times when we talk about uh, policies and these things, we really look to government, but we need to look at young people across the entire society, enabling young people and adults to benefit equally from and contribute equally to development outcomes. Right? So youth management enables young people and adults to benefit, as I said, equally from and contribute equally to development outcomes by promoting age diversity in public consultations, state institutions to reflect the needs and concerns of different age cohorts in decision making, aligning short-term emergency responses with investment into long-term economic, social, environmental objectives to ensure the well-being of future generations, right? And I think that is a very important point where obviously if they're in a crisis, yes, we want to quick end this, we want the quickest solutions, but we also need to go back and we need to be able to assess and analyze, okay, what is the long-term impact of these issues and how can we set ourselves up for success? And I think this is part of what this program is trying to really bring home to, like how can we analyze what has, got, what has already happened and how we put things in place to really um, learn from the past and be able to adapt and create a new system of being, a new way of being that is beneficial for all. Right? Youth mainstreaming focuses on providing targeted policies and services for the most vulnerable youth populations, including young people not in education or employment or training, young migrants, homeless youth, and young women, adolescents, and children facing increasing risk of domestic violence. So I think really and truly in Trinidad, when we talk about migrants, right, for example, I feel like they're like this, as much as they're visible in our society, we also treat them like they're not there. We treat the young people like they're not there. Like there's no real policies to deal with them in terms of education and employment and really making sure that they have a fair opportunity in to be go. Because at the end of the day, the reality is that these persons are children older persons, racial and religious minorities, sexual minorities, and those even with disability and so on. Youth mainstreaming therefore is a part of a broader strategy for non-discrimination and equality for all. So it's not, as much as it's youth mainstreaming, it's not just about young people, right? Because young people are a part of multiple groupings, multiple communities, and therefore it also brings in that aspect of diversity and making sure that everyone is included in the process. So that bearing that in mind, I just wanted to kind of speak on some of the work that was done by youth council and other organizations, youth-led organizations during the pandemic to really bring forward youth mainstreaming and really take advantage of the opportunity that was the pandemic, right? As much as it was a crisis and you know, it was really something that no one wanted to happen, but there were also some opportunities to uh, make things happen that probably would not have been able to happen otherwise, right? So during the pandemic, the Youth Council was able to host a virtual youth summit, and we saw participation from young people across the region, from Belize to Jamaica to Guyana, even persons from Latin America and even Africa were part of our sessions. Because it was online, because it was virtual, also it was the beginning of the pandemic before persons became um, Zoom fatigue. <laughs> you know, so we had the opportunity to really um, have meaningful discussions around different topics such as employment, um, education, volunteering, around mental health and health and wellness. And we, so we were able to have 
amazing discussions and we were able to really bring together young people, not just locally, but regionally and internationally as well. And coming out of that, we saw where the government um, in 2020 started to put together um, the Roadmap to Recovery Team. And we felt as young people that that wasn't reflective of us, right? There were, I believe it was 22 persons or so. I can't remember how many people it was, but it was a significant number of people and not one of the persons there was representative of a young person. I think that, you know, spoke a lot and we felt that instead of just complaining about it, let's do something about it. And we created what was called Youth COVID Response Initiative where we as young people created a committee of our own with our peers um, that was reflective of our, of our country, was reflective in terms of gender, in terms of demographics, um, we welcome this from Trinidad and Tobago to be a part of the committee, really creating recommendations around different areas that we found was important, tourism, agriculture, um, employment, volunteering. So a lot of issues that we found that was important to young people, we came together and we did that and we were able to also create what we call the YCRI report which was then forwarded to the Roadmap to Recovery team for them to look and say, okay, these are the recommendations coming from young people. And some of it we saw, we can't necessarily take direct credit for it being a part of what they submitted, but we know that our voice was represented in, in a small way. And we also saw that what we thought about as young people was in some ways also similar, right? And because of that, we were also a part, um, selected to be a part of a knowledge series on equitable recovery in the Caribbean, um, small island development states by UNESCO, right? So because of the work that we as young people came together as a community to put together, creating these recommendations, we were then recognized internationally by UNESCO to be a part of their series. We were able to create a think piece that was representative of young people in the Caribbean that spoke to the challenges that we faced. And that was a part of, uh, was published a part of their series, right? As well, coming, connecting to that, we also participated in the Global Student Summit, really examining vaccine and vaccine justice and fairness to trust, right? Because vaccines, as much as it was easy for us in Trinidad to have access to vaccine at a certain point. That was not necessarily the case for other countries and other communities. It was still a challenge for persons to access vaccines. And we really wanted to promote um, equitable access, right? Persons in Trinidad chose to say, no, but at least they had access to it. And some people didn't even have those opportunities, right? So just in wrapping up, we find that it's very important for us as a community to really uplift our young people, to really bring them to the forefront and really examine like how can they contribute to the greater good of our society, but also how do we lift them up, right? Young people is a reservoir of knowledge and experience. And you know, our young people are very creative and dynamic and that's part of what youth is about. Youth is really about um, the enthusiasm, the energy, the creativity, that's what young people bring, right? A lot of times. And, you know, the older generation also has a certain level of knowledge and experience that once you bring that together, we as a society will be unstoppable. But we need to value both parts. We need to value both aspects. We can't see young people as a nuisance or something to like, okay, there's some young people there or whatever. Yes, young people have their challenges. Yes. There are certain things that young people go through. And part of the reasons why we see the challenges of young people come up so often is because we don't listen to them. If we listen to them and we have these discussions and we really um, connect you know, and support what young people need, I think we'll be able to address a lot of the issues that we have in our society. So in closing, I just wanna say thank you um, to the team for the opportunity to share and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Shanice. That was definitely another enlightening presentation this afternoon. Um, one of the things, and there are lots of things that stayed with me from your presentation, 
But one of the things that to me is the main takeaway is that youth mainstreaming and addressing the issues that youth are facing is not just about the youth. As part of the community, it affects all of us. So if we don't pay attention, it's going to negatively affect us. And I like that you also pointed out that when you felt that as a youth group or a group of young people that your voice wasn't being heard, you weren't afraid to take charge of your future and make your voice heard. And that's something, you know, we have to pay attention to. It's not just about giving opportunities and saying that we're, we're speaking about the youth, but doing so in a meaningful way. And I mean, I'm so proud of you all for doing that. So we have some questions coming in, but just a little housekeeping reminder, the feedback questionnaire is going to be posted in the chat for our viewers. So please take the time to complete the feedback questionnaire. We really would appreciate your contribution to us improving the way we do business and we meet your needs as our stakeholders. So Fallon, our first question is directed to you. Um, our audience member has asked for, they pointed out that you mentioned digitization and innovation as ways to improve our healthcare systems. And the question is, what are some of the services you would like to see either changed, implemented or improved? And how soon do you think these changes can take place within the region? Okay, thank you for that question. Digitization and innovation is here. Um, it's been here. We have a lot of young people, <laughs> not piggybacking on Shanice, but um, we have a lot of people who are inventing these quick apps that are quite responsive. Um, there's a hub in Trinidad in Kariri via Kariri and um, Microsoft's local office here that funds a lot of health responsive apps. Um, to answer you directly, one of the things I would like to see is a standardized health record system that allows persons to move around and have their records in one place safely secured, say on a cloud-based solution, so that you can retrieve it and have a faster turnaround on care. Because we know that service delivery on care is long in getting appointments, in actually receiving care and in follow-up care. So at all levels of the care, you know, prior to receiving the care, while you're receiving the care and waiting after receiving the care, as well as management and follow-up, it's all long. And talk to anybody, it's just the duration is insane sometimes in terms of how long you wait to receive care. So cloud-based solution or apps, um, there are local hubs that develop. Um, there are a lot of young people at the forefront of developing rapid response time apps. Um, the technology is out there, uh, building a standards-based IT system. Um, the standards are out there. There are health um, IT systems that are internationally standardized, standardized for rapid health information that's been there uh, to link your labs with your patients, with your doctors, and then giving the patients that information in the palm of their hands. I think those are the things that I'd like to see. Um, I think it's totally possible in terms of how soon it really depends on the will of those who are designing some of these solutions to not just look sometimes at the big ticket solutions for the big wins, but really looking at if you ask anybody on the receiving end of care, what is most important to them? It would be yes to feel better, but sometimes it is to know how I'm going to get better, to know when I'm going to get better, to know what exactly I'm dealing with with this, this diagnosis in a language that is accessible to me. So the other aspect of it is the rapid communication, but also um, tailoring that communication, using technology to get to the patients in a way that they can use it to empower themselves. I think, and it can happen soon, as soon as we're willing. Thank you, Fallon. And with youth, like Shanice just shared with us, it, they can definitely drive that much faster than we can see it happening. Um, Shanice, here's a question for you. And this was something, I mean, we've heard a lot about persons talking, not just about the physical effects of the pandemic, 
um, but also the mental effects of the pandemic. And one of the questions coming in for, for you specifically is whether or not there are statistics regarding either mental health or abuse among young persons during the pandemic? And if so, what measures are there in place to deal with these issues? Right. Um, I think that's an excellent question. When it comes to abuse, I'm, I don't know, I can't speak specifically around um, if there are information locally, specifically around young people. I know that some research was done in terms of like women experiencing domestic violence or gender-based violence and stuff like that, but I can't speak specifically to young people. I think that's a really um, interesting thing that we can look at to examine. Um, but also in terms of support, I know that you know what exists is what's there. I don't think there was anything specifically created. I know that they have like the police app that you could try to message persons secret, um, discreetly, like the TTPS app, there's a mechanism on there. I know that they also, in terms of, gender, I know they created the, um, you know, violence affects both men and women, and um, that must be stated, but also there's the gender unit and stuff like that. So, you know, it's not just for, for women, it's for, for men and women. So I know that is also something, a facility that is also available there. If it's children, I know the, the Children's Authority as well is there as a mechanism to um, respond to violence when it comes to young people. Thank you, Shanice. And maybe this is another thing for you all as a youth group to look at and see how you could drive solutions to support each other during this time. Alan, my next question is for you. Um, we in Trinidad and Tobago are an unhealthy population. I don't think that's a big secret. How do you convince a person who isn't currently experiencing health issues to change their diet and adopt a healthier lifestyle? Right. So <laughs> convincing is the, is the key word in that question there. You can't convince anyone to do something that they themselves do not see as important, ultimately. Um, relatively speaking, once a person doesn't have, is of sound mind <laughs> and is an adult, you definitely can always make recommendations. I think one of the things about ownership with health is we have to understand how preventative measures like, like lifestyle, exercise, and the type of food we eat and how often we move is more important than let's say some of the outputs of health, like a particular size that you are or a particular um, body shape or a particular you know, look, I think as a, as a society in Trinidad and Tobago in particular, we tend to be very, very body image, you know, carnival has this aspect of it too. And we think that that means that it creates health and that's not true at all. So cholesterol, for example, is a measure where you can be appearing um, physically well and your cholesterol can be high. And so I think to answer the question is what is the motivation and what is health? So let's get that clear with the person you're speaking to um, in the sense of reaching them where they are about what they think health is, share a bit about what you think health might be, but more so from a space of finding that one thing that might be the lowest hanging fruit to, to, to get them to do something. So I wouldn't advocate asking someone to start running half marathons if they don't like running and walking, but they prefer dancing or they prefer some other type of movement so really it's it's an individual type it's a people-centered approach of having a conversation about what that person is you know more likely to do and also what health really is thank you very much Fallon so here's a question for both of our panelists now um, we have a situation where we have the older generations are now in a position where for the most part, they are in the healthcare system dealing with a lifestyle disease, which for a lot of persons comes as a surprise because, you know, but I'm healthy, I'm skinny, I've not been doing this badly or that. It comes as a surprise. But they are now depending on their children who are part of the workforce or who are youth 
to support them mentally and physically throughout this journey. There's a toll that takes that is taking place not only on the persons who are unwell, but also on the children, whether they be adults, working adults, or youth. What, you know, how can we help the young people, the youth specifically, in dealing with this additional crisis? And also, how can we help workers um, and persons who are in workspaces? You know, it is a Labor Day panel. So as in a workspace issue, place or workplace setting, sorry, how can we help workers and young persons deal with this issue of supporting their parents through the healthcare system and their healthcare journey at a particular point in their lives? Can you see you can go I'll through? Take, no problem, I'll take it. Um, so I think that's a very complex issue because I feel like there are so many things um, in one there, right? So one, you have to deal with the immediate issue. The, pe the person is unwell and you need to address the situation, right? I think when it comes to workplace, I think, you know, being able to have the time off to do it is probably like probably one of the most immediate um, challenge because sometimes if someone, for example, wants to take sick leave to take someone else to the um, hospital or even their own child, sometimes the employer is like, well, you're not sick, you know? So like, how the person uses sick leave or is able to use that sort of leave is something that we probably need to have a conversation about and really challenge. Also looking at, yes, during the pandemic, a lot of people were able to work from home and have a lot of flexible time in terms of being able to um, complete their duties as an as a employee. Obviously, not everyone can do that based on the role that they have, but also I think that's also something that persons can explore in terms of how do workers um, manage their time, right? Uh, as a young person, I think, or even as a family, I think we also need to have conversations around health, around debts, around things like wills and insurance, and how do we protect ourselves for the future? How do we prepare just in case something happens? Because a lot of times, well, you, you want me to die or you know people will be like things like that like people don't even want to broach the topic because they're fearful of of that and all those things or they may maybe lack in trust with their children or their family or whatever so i think we need to also have those conversations of like what is in place what are the contingencies if something would to happen because persons may have things in place but if you don't know or your children don't know then there's no use for it you may have insurance but no one knew so it just sit down someplace. So it's like, how do we have those conversations about how do we take care of you as you get older? How do we prepare in case something happens? How can we afford these things? You know what I mean? Because, you know, the young person is young and also we as young people need to recognize we're not going to be young forever and we also need to put things in place for ourselves. Thank you, Shanice. Fallon, would you like to add anything? Um, just... I think Shanice covered a good bit of it there, but to just say that, um, yeah, people are living longer with debilitating lifestyle diseases. So whereas you may have had a 10 year span of it, there are people who live 20 to 14, even more years with say um, diabetes, which could be slow progressing, but take a toll and the community around you, be it your family member or your spouse or your children who would be taking care of you, they need system support. So touching based on what, on what Shani said about workplace um, flexibility, learning to remodel in many different ways. I mean, not just the person who is working who has to take their parents to the, to the facility, but also the hours of operation of the primary care facilities, for example. They close at four, sometimes earlier. They close at four, but the service ends at 2 p.m. Are we staggering some of our public health facilities in some of the community settings to then not just help but you know there's other services that we cannot access after a certain hour so it again have we learned anything from the pandemic about the way we approach the system so one of the, the things in the future but you can't do right now is, is is looking at staggering the system and one of the things that Shanice just talked about that I think is the highlight is having that sensibility that a care of a person is a community effort and that there's a mental health tool among uh, 
you know, the people immediately around you and that that is a care service that needs to be provided in addition to that immediate patient who is the parent in this question. Thank you very much, Alan. We have a very interesting question coming in. Um, the question starts off with contextualizing the fact that Cuba is notoriously famous for pioneering telemedicine, which is essentially digitized in every way. Can we piggyback off of what it has and what continues to work for them, given your suggestions? And the person continues, the question continues, what I'm saying is that regionally, can we rely on their expertise to help us spearhead our own digitization within healthcare? So to speak. Alan, I think yeah, I, I, <laughs> so I could go. I could go for it. And if Shanice wants to add as well, add as well, I say absolutely. I mean, Cuba has been at the forefront of health in many different ways, not just telemedicine. Um, again, it may come down to the political will to see a space like Cuba having a leading model and acknowledging very much how adaptable some of these models can work in our setting. Of course, we don't take models and just you know sort of band-aid them, but there's definitely. Um, uh, advancements in cardiovascular health uh, over the years. We know many of um, of our leaders have accessed uh, health um, in Cuba and telemedicine is just one of the many things that Cuba is on the forefront of. Um, there are other countries that are doing in the Caribbean space. Uh, Jamaica looks not just into telemedicine, but they look into their indigenous plants. Um, not, not just cannabis, uh, all, you know, their provisions and, and how this helps their local population be a healthier society. So there's other places in the region that we must be able to look to um, and be brave enough to look at models like that in our own region, as opposed to only looking outside of the region for expertise, because a lot of the environment and the considerations around culture are quite similar. Yeah, so, so just to add to what Fallon said, I think she had a great response. I think that it is important to look at the Caribbean community and see, okay, what are the best practices? What is working for them? How can we implement them? And even where persons have gone around, we look at that and say, okay, this is something, you know, these are some of the things that we need to look out for. How do we then factor for these challenges and stuff like that? Um, when we look at Cuba, Cuba has really supported the world when it comes to nurses, when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic. I know that um, the labor movement also had a petition that was going around for, I believe, to give Cuba a Nobel Peace Prize medal or these nurses um, for their efforts during the pandemic. I don't know what, where that is or whatever, but I know that was an uh, effort that was being made. So I think that we should really... Um, commend them and put our hats off to them for the work that they've done um, across the region and across the world. And we should um, look at within the Caribbean for best practices and how we can then um, build on those things. Thank you, Shanice and Fallon. We have a question specifically for you, Fallon. Um, the question is that when you speak about patients, and people-centered healthcare, how do you factor, factor in the medical fraternity? Do you believe that there would be support for this approach from them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let me start off by saying that if healthcare provider is beyond uh, the clinician and the, and the nurse, it's also the administrator who is the data entry clerk, the first point of contact at the clinic. Um, it's the medical records person, so it's a health personnel, um, the laboratory technician, the phlebotomist, all these persons, um, they, their life becomes easier when the system is designed around a patient-centered care model because the patient-centered care model is therefore improving efficiency, improving communication of record keeping. So in its name, it seems that it's only concerned about the person in front of you receiving the care but really because it's a series of concentric circles of model in the model, um, the benefits go all around 
where there's efficiencies in the system, there's improvement in governance, there's improvement in communication, there's improvement in reliability and testing, um, which with the, with the person receiving the care at the middle, but um, the model has been around, it's in use in, in different countries. Um, the NHS to some extent uses it uh, in some applications in some of their disease management styles. Um, for example, I would I would say like in Trinidad, we do have like in pregnancy, it's not a disease, but it is treated and it's, so you, you give birth in a hospital or a health center. Um, there is the Mamatoto Health Center, which is um, midwifery, which is a, a little more less clinical in its approach. And they are considered a people centered and they have a relationship with the Port Screen General Hospital. And so healthcare practitioners work around the patient's needs in that setting. If it becomes an emergency case, the person is transferred to the hospital. So it, yeah, I mean, it, it exists and it, it is, um, it, it exists in countries and the aspect of it that we care. Thank you very much, Fallon. Shanice, here's a question for you when we speak about the youth. From your perspective, from what you have experienced thus far, especially coming out of the crisis that the pandemic is, um, what do you think when we look at crises would be the best way for us to handle them in a manner that's sensitive towards the needs of the youth and meeting their needs during a crisis? Um, I think the most important part is to listen, to engage young people and find out from them, like what is happening, how, what, how are they experiencing certain things, you know, what are the challenges they face and even asking them like, what do they need? You know what I mean? So even sometimes you may ask young person, okay, what are your challenges? And they may list out X, Y, and Z, and then we prescribe to them what they need instead of asking them, like, what do you see as the solution to your problems? What do you see as the solution to your challenges? We, you know, because a lot of times young people sometimes already know, like, what they need or how can their problems be solved. So I think, or even working with them, because, so there are different levels to it. Right, so there's where we do the prescriptive model. Yes, it may be helpful, but it's not um, ideal, right? So the best mechanism, and, and really going back to the whole idea of youth mainstreaming, is making sure that young people are a part of it from the get-go and throughout the entire process. Therefore, you're able to get, with anything you get by, in the same way with the healthcare set, um, the same way with healthcare, Right? For example, if it is you expect a nurse to go and do X, Y, and Z, maybe you should ask them first, okay, how is your day? How does this fit into your day as an as a employee? Do you have 10 minutes extra to do this extra thing? You know what I mean? So it's like really considering your target audience and really considering their needs fully and making sure that they can say, okay, maybe I can do this at the end of a shift or I can do this at this point, but don't expect something. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's not about you looking at them and prescribing what is best for young people or for any group or any community. It's, for, it's about engaging those communities and finding out from them what are their challenges and co-creating with them, working with them, empowering them to create these solutions so it, or in order to meet the end goal. So that one, they are part of the process, so they have that buy-in, they're excited to see what they've created come to fruition, making sure that they share with you know others, hey, this is what's happening, this is what we are doing, this is well, that's what they want to do. You know what I mean? So you want that buy-in. We want persons to own whatever the solution is. We want them to advocate for it because that's the highest form of participation where someone is an advocate for something. You want to create advocates. You don't want somebody to just, okay, well they try it out. No. We want people to advocate for whatever the solution is. Thank you, Shanice. I can hear my niece applauding that answer. Don't tell me what to do as a youth. Ask me what I think I should do. Another question for you, Shanice. Um, what are some obvious advantages of community mobilization that you have witnessed generally, and especially when tackling a crisis like the pandemic? And the third element of the question, and how can we achieve or encourage these good practices, these advantages? Right, so 
one of the key advantages is that one, you save money and you save time. Because if you go and you establish a program or a project that nobody wants or cares about, you're wasting money, right? A lot of times we see, as working for a company and or a government institution, they created this project or a park in a location that no one would ever visit, right? It was built, millions of dollars were spent, and nothing came of it. There was security for two weeks, and after that, it was burglarized and cut down to the ground because it was installed what was there, right? One, there was no consultation with the public or anyone else to say, okay, is this something that's a correct fit or whatever? So it's like, you need to, you would save money, time, and effort by actually engaging the community. The community already has the knowledge of what's happening, what's going on, right? They, they live it every day. So they can speak to their true experience and really give meaningful context and information. You can't go in already knowing because then what's the point, right? If it is you're doing a consultation, you can't go in with the idea that with your project in mind and you're trying to fit the people into that. We, you have to go in with an open mind of like what can come out of it, what can be inspired from it, right? So those are some of the, the direct benefits. And in order to do that, I think we need to meet people where they are, right? We can't expect to, um, you want to talk to rural youth by hosting it in Port of Spain. You want to talk to, <laughs> you know what I mean? You want to talk to mothers, you want to talk to working women and you're hosting at 12 o'clock. You know what I mean? Like, meet people where they are. You need to be accommodated. and you need to assess needs and provide relevant solutions. I think that, you know, that's the best I could do. <laughs> Thank you, Shanice. That, that's quite a good best. Alan, here's a question for you as we are coming close to our end of today's session. Um, speaking about mobilization, and mobilization of the medical community. When we think within Trinidad and Tobago, we think of the medical community, there's the public sector and then there's the private sector. Do you think that there is any, there are any benefits to mobilizing the medical community, both private and public? And how do you think we can achieve such mobilization to benefit us as a community? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are organizations that exist that help to mobilize the um, the medical staff, private and public, uh, the Trinidad and Tobago Medical Association, which is different from the medical board of Trinidad and Tobago, is an association that helps to initially really look at it from a continuous medical education standpoint. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, it is not mandatory for continuous medical education, but in other countries it is. And this organization, for example, TNCMA, they work really hard to, to provide a sort of community space for healthcare providers so that they are often then mobilized around a response around COVID, often mobilized um, as a fraternity um, and as a, a, a group of providers. Yes, it tends to be um, a lot more of the healthcare providers tend to be the doctors in this instance, but there are midwifery associations, there are nursing associations um, and mobilizing them around improving health care deliveries that they want it just as bad as we do as the recipients only of care. Because as I said during the presentation, they are also recipients, recipients of care as providers in this country. Many of them are also receiving a lot of their care here, maybe probably not always in the public health sector. And what we need to understand in Trinidad is that private and public, are, they, don't, they are often not very separated in terms of some of the actual practitioners. A lot of them move between spaces. And so a lot of private practitioners have at some point worked in the public health sector where they do that simultaneously, especially if they are at a specialty level, because there are only so many specialists that we may have. And therefore, um, you know, they are committed to improving the health system just as much as the recipients of care because they see the gaps better than we do. They experience it every single day with COVID. It was even more um, abundantly clear about the shortages and the logistic challenges. And so I think that there are organizations that are already, uh, that already exist and we need to have conversations where we have 
not just used at the table for the sake of tokenism, but you know, younger doctors and nurses as well, who are more willing to challenge the way things are done and then get change management up and going. Because uh, I think um, just to, to, to marry both of our presentations there a bit in this answer is that a lot of the younger um, doctors, when you mobilize them, they have the, they have the enthusiasm, they have access to a lot more of the technology, they use it in their everyday lives, um, and they have a desire to work more efficiently because everything else in their life is instant and more efficiently. So, it's, so yeah, so the organizations that mobilize and we can and they are, um, there's space, spaces for, you know, the younger practitioners as well. I think there's an opportunity waiting there. Thank you very much, Fallon. Yes, our next question is for you. It's actually three questions, so I'll ask them one at a time. What can we put in place to ensure that youths are empowered? That's the first question. Um, okay, so I think one of the things, one of the things that we can start with is really looking at, we can start on a policy level, right? So there's the national youth policy, um that you know that was a well the recent one was was passed i believe last year um so we can start there if we're looking for a starting point we can look at the national policy and see okay this is our country's roadmap for young people how can we work as a society as a collective to make sure that this is established within our country right we can examine it obviously there are there are going to be gaps because there are certain things that, you know, maybe government mandates, but, you know, may not necessarily fit nicely into the box of what governments want. So we can, that can be a starting point of let's examine what the national policy looks like. And even if we can identify what the gaps are, we can look to tackle those things or even tackle what is currently there. And we, and it's not just about on a governmental level, but we need to also look at it when we look at civil society, also looking at us as employers and the business society as well, how do we all come together to really tackle the challenges facing young people to address these issues? And the second part of the question is, do we have any plans for youth empowerment or is it still in the brainstorming stage? Um, So I'm, I'm not sure how to really tackle that question, but I said there is a national youth policy, right? So for example, even looking at what is considered youth, it changed, right? So it was originally 12 to 30, so it's now 12 to 35, right? So persons who may not originally consider themselves to be youth, they're still um, considered a youth in terms of um, the government and stuff like that, right? So I think there is um, some level of goodwill when it comes to um politically somewhat to to put forward youth development and youth empowerment but it isn't necessarily left up to one institution right and i'm probably maybe repeating myself but i feel like the part of it is that we all have a responsibility to young people to make sure that okay when we are at work who's the youngest person in the office um do they have a voice in terms of what is happening? What are their challenges? How can we support them, right? This is labor day. So it's like, okay, who can, how can we mentor these young people? Um, how can we provide support? Maybe they come to work late or maybe they may not be dressed appropriately. How can we as peers or persons provide those support, provide that education? Because sometimes, you know, you have certain things are like learning lessons, things you have to learn in the environment. They may not do things perfectly as a young person, but that's part of why they're there, to gain that experience. We can't expect young people to come out of schooling and be fully prepared. They're not going to be, because they've been to school, they've read, you know what I mean? So it's like, why you need to give young people the opportunity to, to show what they can do, but you also need to put them in an environment that would allow them to really bloom and show their best abilities or whatever. They're not going to do these do things the way that you want them to do it, but you know, within certain parameters, you should also give them the freedom to express themselves and do it the way that they can do it and ensure that the job is done. You know what I mean? So it, empowerment isn't left up to an institution. It is for all of us. We are all 
responsible to empower young people, even as a young person myself. I have an opportunity to empower other people. If I'm in a space and I see a young person doesn't feel safe or they don't feel like their voice is being heard, I can be like, hey, what were you saying? Hey, how can I support you? How can I help? So it's up, up to all of us as a collective, as a community, to say, okay, how can we support young people? Looking at young people in your home, in your family, in your church, whatever communities and cultures you're a part of, you have a responsibility to really speak up, but also allow them to have the voice to say what's going on with them or just share or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, just give your people a chance wherever they are. Thank you, Shinus. Wherever they are, includes professional communities as Fallon pointed exactly. out for us. And the third question, which I feel you've kind of answered already, but I will still pose it and you can add anything you feel that you need to add. How can we have those in power push plans of this kind, youth empowerment, to avoid the negative impact of the pandemic? Right. So I think we need to challenge them. We need to challenge them when it is that we see things happening or um, situations go by that young people are not included, that their voice is not given a chance or whatever. So that we need to say, hey, there's young people here. And same way that we as a collective did it on a small scale, we were able to say, hey, we don't see young people here. Let's do something that brings young people's voices to the forefront and make sure that young people are recognized, they're seen and they're heard, and they're actively participating. They're not just tokens, they're not just being patronized, but they're actively participating in generating solutions that affect them. So at the end of the day, even though, yes, there are people in power, but there are also people in proximity to those people in power. So we all need to speak up and say, hey, I don't think we included young people here. Hey, have we considered that? Like, what is the angle? What is it? We also need to kind of have that as a lens. I know it's not necessarily that's automatic for everyone. And because, you know, I've been in this space is something that I think about. You know what I mean? Same way that um, if someone who works in health and safety goes somewhere, they see things with that, like, oh my God, this place is like, you see it from a specific lens. You know what I mean? And we need to put on the lens of like, what, how can we consider young people? and the things that we do. How are young people being considered? And not just young people, it's all about um, minorities and, and groups that may not necessarily be represented. How do we encourage these groups to be a part of whatever processes we are part of? How can they benefit from various opportunities that are being, being afforded? How can they also access those things? Like, yes, you might say, okay, well, put us online, but that, we've seen that with education, with students, not everyone has access, you know what I mean? And so like, yes, you can't just put everything to send a, a letter and you can't put everything online. You need to have those mixed um, metal. We must have those dualities because that is the reality of our society today. Maybe at some point, you know, it's a hundred percent. Everyone is educated. Everyone has access. But until that point, we need to be able to really think about like how with persons who who are less, who isn't as fortunate, not, I won't say less fortunate, but persons who may not have the same um, tools get to whatever it is that we um, are trying to do. So that's what we need to think about, right? So if it is that you have a pro program, you're like, okay, this is my target audience, but who, who do I want to target? How are they going to get it? And we need to kind of think of that when it comes to all groups, not just young people. Thank you very much, Shanice. As we draw closer to the end of today's webinar, I would now like to invite Fallon and then Shanice to give Shanice a little space to catch her breath, the opportunity to bring, to give your final remarks. Thank you, Sangeeta, and thank you, Shanice, um, for, for this lovely um, exchange that we're having. I think one of the, the threads that is coming through is, is a component of involving the people who are the recipient of any sort of opportunity in the creation of the solutions or the co-creation of the solutions, be it youth, be it the healthcare providers, be it the patient. Um, and it, it really requires a, a, a different lens on the way that we communicate and our style of cultural communication when it comes to designing or redesigning, if you will, the way forward out of a crisis. 
um, and just coming back to the theme of, of our panel, you know, um, Churchill might have said it, but we could, uh, we could run with it in our own way about never wasting this crisis. And we have several crises upon us. Um, I'd be remiss if, even though I'm here to talk about how it's not mentioned, you know, the climate change crisis that doesn't take a backseat just because um, we're focused on COVID. Um, and so as a region, as a small island developing states, I think the listening quality and the co-creation of the solutions really has to come from us for us. Um, a lot of the policies and the frameworks might exist out there around what we think are so much bigger uh, problems than we can just imagine. COVID is bigger than just us in the Caribbean. Uh, climate change is bigger than just us in the, in, in the Caribbean. But this is our home. We have the solutions here. We listen to each other from youth to those with the experience from across uh, the water right there in Cuba. We could really start to zone in on on a lot of the solutions there, are a lot of civil societies, uh, um, organizations and NGOs already doing the work. You know, we don't just have to look at central government for solutions, which we know, but sometimes we need to reiterate. Um, one of the things around it is that the economics, which I, I mean, I am not really the best person to talk about it, but I would say that some of these models are not only cost efficient, but they're cost savings when you start uh, really designing for your community, for your region. When you use local resources, you are putting money back into your, um, the national uh, line of income. You're putting the money back in regionally when you use um, solutions that have been developed in the Caribbean. So listening, the communication, the co-creation of the solutions um, and the economic benefits that I'm sure a better person apt could tell you about how that can work. Um, in terms of the crises that we have in front of us, you know, we can, the Caribbean, as Mia Motley, if I, if I will paraphrase her to say, um, she has really been uh, refreshing to observe <laughs> in this space as a, as a young, uh, relatively young, not youth according to the national youth policy anymore, but as a relatively young woman in the Caribbean, she's been refreshing to observe she was right when she said that the Caribbean has had uh, frameworks and solutions for crises long before COVID. And we can be looked to for the answers for climate change and for things like the healthcare crisis that we're going through. Well, just in closing, I like to say that a lot of times um, solutions may seem to be difficult, you know, it may be um, challenging to say, okay, well, to actually get full participation or proper participation, but that doesn't mean that the solution isn't worth it, you know, because at the end of the day, it's better we do it well than do something that brings no value to anyone. So it's important that we do the difficult work do the difficult thing in terms of, you know, actually engaging young people or engaging any community and really working with them to create what is necessary and what is, what is beneficial to them, but our, you know, global community at large, you know? So as much as we see young people as a challenge and difficult, but we also need to see them as a resource. We need to see them, we've invested, you know, so much in young people's education from preschool to tertiary. You know what I mean? We've invested so much and we are grateful, but also young people want to be able to do more, to be able to give them the opportunity to actually um, work in the fields that they feel passionate about, do the things that, you know, that they want to do to bring, bring back glory to Trinidad, to really communicate, to contribute to our society as a whole, but there needs to be space for that. You know what I mean? So we all need, we all have uh, initiative. We all need to take the initiative to really look at young people and see how can we all support them, right? And how we can all support each other, how we can support all the communities that we are part of, and how can we really bring 
these voices to the forefront and really have meaningful conversations, not just say, well, it can't be done. Well, people spend, find money to do all what they want to do. So let's find the money to do what is necessary, right? And I know workers could really, <laughs> really um, agree with me on that. Government find money for all kinds of things. So let's find money for what is necessary at the end of the day. So with that, I just want to say thank you and a happy Labor Day to everyone. Thank you very much, Fallon and Shanice. And thank you very much to our viewing audience. On behalf of the host of this event, the Elmer Francois Institute for Research and Debate of the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies, a hearty thank you. And we invite you to join us tomorrow for the third in our three webinar series. The next webinar is entitled The Arts and Renaissance, and I'm looking forward to listening in and taking away from that panel the lively discussion and information and solutions they present to us, much the same as panels one, and I dare say panels two have already done. And just one final reminder, please complete the feedback questionnaire, which is posted in the chat. So for everyone, if you're on your way home, have a safe journey. For those of us who are already there, please take care, keep safe, and let's not let this crisis go to waste.